Hello everyone and welcome to video 3 of 4 for 8.1, Energy Sources. This is the slide we left off with last time where we saw how a nuclear reactor works. So the control rods in combination with the moderator and the uranium produce heat through a fission reaction. Okay, so that heat warms up the water, that water becomes steam, the steam turns a turbine which then rotates a generator and produces electricity. That resulting steam gets condensed becomes liquid water and moves through the cycle once again. I'm not going to spend too much time on that since we did spend quite a bit of time last time discussing how this works. Okay, so we're moving on to uh, the third part of this. All right, this question is about the production of nuclear energy and its transfer to electrical energy. Part A, when a neutron collides with a nucleus of uranium-235, the following reaction can occur. Notice it says can occur because we saw last time that it doesn't necessarily have to fission into barium and krypton. It might result into two other product reactants. All right, state the name given to this type of nuclear reaction. Okay, so right now when you're looking at this kind of question, you're probably thinking, wow, that's pretty simple. And you're right. And that's because we are studying fission right now. So being able to look at that question and say, well, the name of this nuclear reaction is nuclear fission. Uh, the splitting of a heavy uranium isotope or a heavy isotope in general. When it comes to something like a test or exam where you're not necessarily, you, you hadn't necessarily just studied that topic, it might be a little bit more difficult to recall this term. But nonetheless, here it is. This is a fission reaction. All right, part two, energy is liberated in this reaction. In what form does this energy appear? Well, think back to how we just discussed how the nuclear reactor works. You have a uranium-235 nucleus, or maybe plutonium, whatever it happens to be. Uh, it undergoes fission, it splits, and a huge amount of energy is released. Well, what does that energy do? Well, it heats up water. Right? That means that the energy that is liberated is in the form of heat. But not just heat. Remember, if you look at this reaction, you will produce heat on the right side, but you also have two neutrons that come out as a byproduct. And if you remember carefully, we said that those two neutrons can then initiate their own chain reaction with the two more uranium-235 atoms, since it only takes a uranium-235 atom plus a neutron to start the nuclear fission uh, reaction. But the, the key is that these two neutrons have to be moving at just the right speed, which means that they're either moving too fast or too slow. That's what the moderator's for. <laughs> What that means is some of the energy appears in the form of kinetic energy of these neutrons. So we have kinetic energy of the neutrons and we have heat energy on the right side of that equation. Okay, so that's what we're looking at there. Heat and some kinetic energy of product neutrons. All right, moving on to the next part. Describe how neutrons produced in this reaction may initiate a chain reaction. Again, Looking at the left side, we know that uranium-235, when it accepts a neutron, it will become uranium-236, and that is going to be unstable. That unstable uranium-236 will spontaneously decompose into uh, two radioactive products, which may be the combination of barium and krypton, and you will get the two neutrons on the side as well. So these two neutrons, each of which can then, moving at the right speed, combine with two more uranium-235 atoms and go through this process again which each of those will produce two more neutrons. And so this will eventually become a, ideally a self-sustaining reaction, uh, but hopefully not a runaway effect. Now, if it is a runaway effect, you don't really have a nuclear generator anymore so much as you have something like a bomb situation. And so that's why there are measures in place to control the rate of energy production to control the rate of the reaction. That's what the control rods were for. Okay, here we go. The purpose of a nuclear power station is to produce electrical energy from nuclear energy. The diagram below is a schematic representation of the principal components of a nuclear reactor pile used in a certain type of nuclear power station. All right, so let's just take a look at this picture. So we've got some kind of a block. We've got these rods on top. We've got other rods uh, perpendicular moving through here. All right, so we've got our uranium ore fuel rods, right? So this is your mixture of uranium-238 and 235 with a minimum amount of uh, a certain critical amount of uranium-235 to initiate the nuclear fission process. We've got something called a moderator, which in this picture is a graphite block. 
the moderator is what slows down the neutrons. So the neutrons that come um, after the uranium-236 breaks down and fissions into its two products, you have the two neutrons afterwards. This slows them down so they're traveling at just the right speed to emerge and collide with uh, two more uranium-235 nuclei and sustain the reaction. Control rods, this prevents essentially a bomb from being created. Because this is a chain reaction, you don't want it to continue indefinitely. Perhaps there's too much energy being produced uh, or you're not able to control the amount of energy produced. So you want to reduce that. At that point, the control rods get inserted into the system and the control rods are made of a material that can absorb the neutrons. So then they don't react with more uranium-235 atoms. So I just want to put this out there. Before I even read the question, I'm already looking at the scenario. I'm looking at the picture and trying to figure out what's going on and understand all these components. I don't want to just jump to the question. Look at the pictures and try to figure out and explain to yourself what each of these components do and how they work. Because once you do that, answering the question will be much, much simpler. Here we go. The function of the moderator is to slow down neutrons produced in a reaction such as that described in part A above. So CI, explain why it is necessary to slow down the neutrons. Well, we just said the neutrons that are produced as part of the fission reaction might be traveling too fast. They might be traveling too slow. They might be traveling at just the right Goldilocks speed, but you don't know that for sure. So usually these neutrons are moving too fast. And so they have to move through a moderator, which might be graphite. Uh, it might be something called heavy water that slows the neutrons down to just the right speed to interact with the uranium-235 nucleus appropriately. Okay? And that way you have a proper fission reaction. Part two, explain the function of the control rods. Well, we just did that. The control rods essentially absorb the neutrons. And so if your reaction is getting uh, too fast and it's producing too much energy too fast because this is exponential growth after all, um, you have to slow down the rate of the reaction. So you insert the control rods, which will absorb the neutrons, which will prevent them from interacting with more uranium-235 nuclei. Um, similarly, if you want to speed up the rate of reaction, you can remove the control rods. So both of these can occur. Now, usually these control rods are made of boron, but there are other materials that can work as well. Okay, part D, describe briefly how the energy produced by the nuclear reactions is extracted from the reactor pile and then transferred to electrical energy. Well, I mean, we looked at this earlier as well. So in the initial slide in today's video, that was what we finished off with last time. That's how the nuclear reactor works. So you have this fission of uranium-235. And so that releases heat and, of course, the kinetic energy of the neutrons. But it's the heat that we really care about. That heat energy is uh, essentially piped through a system that moves through a tank of water. That water heats up, produces steam, the steam rotates a turbine, and that generates your electricity. And that's what we have here on the slides as well. Hopefully that's okay. All right, let's do a simple calculation problem. Part E, a particular nuclear reactor uses uranium-235 as its fuel source. When a nucleus of uranium-235 absorbs a neutron, the following reaction can take place. Okay, so this time, uranium-235 is breaking down into xenon and strontium, not barium and krypton, right? So it depends. You can get different uh, products here. Show that the energy released in the reaction is approximately 180 mega electron volts. Now, I want you to notice here on the top right, we're given all the information we need. Uh, we have the different components here of the reaction, and we have something on the right here, these values. And it says here, mega electron volts per C squared. Okay, so mega electron volts. This, I mean, mega is a prefix, you know, that means times a million. Uh, electron volts, here you're looking at a measure of energy, right? So instead of using joules, sometimes we use electron volts. Uh, so you have energy divided by C squared. And if you remember Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared, this is why that unit is equivalent to mass. Now it says rest mass um, in relativity, we see that, and what you'll see, I should rather say, what you'll see is that when objects move faster, they get more massive. But I don't really want to get into that right now. Um, for now, let's just take this as is. All right. So um, we want to show that the energy released in the reaction is approximately 180 mega electron volts. Now, you know that on the left side here, I've got some kind of mass. 
and some kind of energy. On the right side, I've got some mass and therefore some kind of energy. Um, but there is also excess energy released on the right side as well. That's the energy that heats up the water, that produces the steam, etc. So we want to show that there's 180 mega electron volts missing from the right side. All right, so we're going to move to our pen and paper now. And I mean, make sure you have the slides in front of you too, so you have those values. Um, I want to just write down that reaction again. So we have uranium uh, 235. Oops. And that's number 92 on the periodic table. And if we add a neutron to that, we are going to get uh, xenon 144. And that has atomic number 54 plus strontium. What is that? Strontium 90. And that has atomic number 38 plus two neutrons. Now, you know that when you look at this, in reality, you have plus energy on the right side. We don't usually write that, but I mean, that's really what it is. And we're trying to figure out what that energy is. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at uh, the energy on the left. We're going to look at the energy on the right. Okay. So the energy of the reactants. So we'll just call that E. Let's call that E sub capital R. The energy of the reactant, so that's uh, one uranium-235 nucleus and one neutron. So take a look at your table. Okay, so uranium-235, we're looking at 2.1895 times 10 to the 5. And for the neutron, we're looking at 939.56. Wow, what a difference. Okay, so grab your calculator and add up those two values. So 2.1895 times 10 to the 5 plus 939.56. So we have about 219,889.56. Uh, that would be electron volts. I'm just looking at the energy here. If everything is per C squared per C squared, then I don't really need to write the per C squared anymore. Okay, now let's look at our products. So that's going to be E sub P. Okay, so I've got the xenon 144, so if you look that up, it's 1.3408 times 10 to the 5. I've got my strontium 90, that's 8.3749 times 10 to the 4. And I've got two neutrons, don't forget those little guys, 2 times 939.56. Grab your calculator, here we go. 1.3408 times 10 to the 5 plus... 8.3749 times 10 to the 4 plus 2 times 939.56. Okay, so here we have 219,708.12. Notice they're not the same, right? And that's what you expect. There's got to be some kind of a difference there. And so that difference, so the delta E, which is going to be the reactants minus the products, Okay, so here we go. So we already have the products on the screen there. So 219.889.56 minus answer. And we have 181.44. Okay, so this is, therefore, this is uh, approximately uh, 180 mega electron volts that we have as a difference. Okay. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Oh, let's put this unit. There we go. So that's about 180 mega electron volts. All right. So this slide marks the end of um, nuclear reactions. The next thing we're going to look at is wind energy. Now, while we did look at nuclear reactions in a lot of detail, and we are going to do quite a bit of detail with the other types of energies as well, not it's not going to be as much as we did for nuclear. Okay. So anyways, there's the slides, but we've already done those calculations. Okay. The first type of uh, different type of energy we're going to look at here is wind energy. Okay, so we have probably, I'm sure you've all seen the, uh, the wind turbines. If you have ever entered the U.S. Canadian border from Windsor back into Canada or you've left, you've probably seen a lot of those wind turbines there. Um, sometimes if you're driving on Highway 401, you might see even Walmart from the highway, you can see that they have their own wind turbine. Uh, a lot of places have their own turbines. It's a renewable source of energy. So 
how does this wind come to be? Well, you probably remember something called convection. So the reason convection can occur, convection is the movement of air which produces wind, is due to differing temperatures above land and water. Okay, so notice in this diagram we've got land, C is small, water, C is big. Just think about that for a moment. Okay? So C does not represent the speed of light here. It represents another quantity that we learned about in thermal physics. Okay? So that quantity is a specific heat capacity. So water has a very large specific heat capacity compared to land, which means it heats up slowly and it also cools down slowly. Land is the opposite. It heats and cools rather fast. This is why countries in the southern hemisphere have more stable average temperatures compared to countries in the north that can have hot summers, they can have cold winters, but you see some countries like Australia, they'll have mild temperatures all year round because there's more water in the southern hemisphere. But enough of that, let's talk about the movement of air. So let's say on land, you consider this pocket of air on land, as it heats up, it becomes less dense and things that are less dense rise. Okay, so you've got this hot air that's rising, leaving behind a region of low pressure. Okay, so now something has to fill that region of low pressure. That's going to be cold air that's coming from the water. Okay, so that leaves a little bit of a gap here. Well, something has to fill that. There has to be some kind of cool air that's coming from above. Okay, so air is falling. I think this might be a little bit easier to see once you see the entire cycle. Okay, so again, you have a region of low pressure. So you have air that is warming up from the land. It's rising because it's less dense. Okay? So that air gets blown away. So either it's going to go left or right here. In this case, it's going left. It moves towards the water. It cools down. That cool air moves down and it goes right directly back across to the land via some kind of wind. Okay? And these are called convection currents. Now, convection currents don't just exist on land. They also exist in water. And some of these convection currents can even take thousands of years to take place, uh, the ones in the water at least. Anyways, we can get into this topic in a lot more detail, but we're not going to get into it in too much right now. Now, the wind turbine gets placed where you have that cool air that's rushing from the water onto the land because you have a high speed, high density of air, which can rotate those blades quite a bit. Okay. All right. Now, the wind turbine is made up of a few, of a few obvious uh, pieces. Obviously, it's got the, uh, the blades. Those blades are rotating because wind is passing through, because air is passing through it. And the faster the air moves, well, the, the more energy you're going to generate. Notice here in the image on the right, it says rotor diameter. Okay, and the rotor diameter comes from the length of the blade. Okay, the length of the blade is effectively the radius of this rotor diameter. And the bigger the diameter is, the more energy you're going to generate. Hopefully that's just common sense. A um, couple things. You have something here called a wind vane on the left. You don't have to memorize this picture here. Um, if you're interested in engineering, it's definitely something that you might want to look into a bit further, but I'll just go over the uh, general aspects here. You have something called a wind vane on the back of the wind, uh, of the wind turbine. Essentially, there is a sensor here that determines the direction of the wind, because if the wind changes direction and your wind turbine can't, it essentially becomes pretty useless because it can only work in one direction. But it doesn't work like that. You've actually got that sensor there that will tell the motor to turn. Uh, that's another word for yaw. OK, so it will turn it. And so it faces the wind and it maximizes output of electricity due to the direction of the wind at that time. OK. Uh, as for how the electricity is generated, think back to how the nuclear reactor works or even how the coal generator or the natural gas power plant worked. It's all the same. At the end of the day, you need something that is rotating. Once you have rotation, you can spin electrical coils within a magnetic field and generate electricity. At the end of the day, that's how it all works. And so this is just another way to cause a rotation, to have air. Okay. So... In this diagram, we're looking at a couple things. So we've got our wind turbine, and we said the radius of that, um, of that circular motion, that's going to be R. So the amount of air that passes through this wind turbine at any point in time can be represented by this cross-section area, which is a circle. Now, if I consider a certain amount of time T, then I know that uh, a certain amount of air is passing through this turbine. And that amount of air I can represent by the volume of this cylinder. Okay, so this amount of air is passing through. It's, the air is moving at speed V, 
and through time t, it covers the distance d. Let's just keep that in the back of our heads for now. We are going to use that when we derive uh, the next formula. Okay, example, determine the power that may be delivered by a wind generator, assuming that the wind kinetic energy is completely converted into mechanical energy. So in this case, it's a little bit of an approximation, which is fine, we will correct for this approximation later. Uh, right now we are assuming 100% efficiency. So this uh, wind turbine is not losing any energy, but that's fine, we're just trying to get to our formula first. Okay, so we are trying to determine the power delivered to the wind generator so that kinetic energy is completely converted. All right, let's go back to our page here. So we are looking for power. Now in physics, power is defined as energy per unit time. Now, how is the wind turbine getting energy? Well, the question tells you that the wind is imparting kinetic energy onto the blades of the fan. So this is EK divided by time. Now, kinetic energy. Hopefully at this point, you've already memorized what that formula is. It's one half mv squared. And if you don't remember, well, hopefully you have your formula booklet nearby. You can look it up quickly. All right. Now, what we saw is that when you have your wind turbine, so this thing rotates, and there is some kind of cross-section area, right? So there is some kind of uh, circular cross-section area that the air flows through based on the rotation of these blades. And over a time t, and this is just what we had in the animation, you have this cylinder volume of air that's passing through after a certain time t. And we saw that uh, that length here, that length of that cylinder is d, and that's going to be equal to the speed of the wind times time, right? Distance is speed times time, or you can call that s if you want. Okay, uh, so that volume of air that moves through the rotator blades within a certain time t, I mean, that's just equal to the area of the circle times d. And, well, I know what the area of a circle is. I'm not going to fill that in just yet, but uh, just keep that in the back of your head. I know that d is going to be speed times time, so a times v times t. That's equal to capital V. Remember, capital V is volume. And so why am I doing this? Well, I'm trying to re remove the expression for mass. I don't want mass here. I don't want to know about the mass of the air. I care more about the density of the air. <clears throat> Excuse me. Earlier when we were studying compressors, back when we were learning about rocket science, you learned that what the role of a compressor, essentially there's some kind of a fan working that takes the air from one side and increases the density uh, and compresses it on the other side. And so what we really care about is the density of the air, not so much the mass. And well, there is a handy relationship between mass and density. Mass is equal to density times volume. So there's that Greek letter there, rho. Okay, so rho is density. So hopefully that's familiar to you. But guess what? It's density times volume. And I already have an expression for volume. It's area times speed of the wind times time. So I have uh, rho times A times V times T. That's equal to mass. Okay. Now I'm going to take that expression and plug it back in over here. So kinetic energy is one half v squared times m, and m is this. It's rho times a times v times t. Well, I've got v squared and I've got v, that makes v cubed, so one half, let's call this rho a v cubed t. So that's kinetic energy. Now remember, the whole point of this was to find an expression for power. Power is kinetic energy over time in this case. Right, so if it's energy divided by time, imagine dividing left and right side by time, all the t's disappear on the right. And on the left, that's just power. So therefore I get power is equal to one half rho a v cubed. So this is the power output by a wind turbine generator. Now I hope you have your formula booklets in front of you. If you don't, just pause the video and go and grab it. So once you have your formula booklet, Remember, we're doing section 8.1, so you're going to look at the bottom of page 7, bottom left, and there are two formulas there. We know the power is energy divided by time. Let me actually get that a little bit closer. I wonder if it'll be easier to see it like this. Now, unfortunately, it's not able to focus very well, but you are looking at the formula in the bottom left here. 
it says power is equal to one half a rho v cubed, and that's the formula that we just derived. Oh, I wonder. No, unfortunately, I can't make that focus, but it is there. Take my word for it. Hopefully, you have your formula booklet in front of you. And you'll see that formula there. Okay, so now let's go back to the slides. So we've already done this. And that last piece here, a is equal to pi r squared. Well, hopefully that is pretty straightforward. Like I kept saying, the cross-section area uh, of, well, of the wind passing through the turbine, that is a circle. So we know the area of a circle is pi r squared, so that can just be filled in here. All right, let's do an example. Since the air is still moving after passing through the rotor area, Obviously, not all of the kinetic energy can be used. The maximum theoretical efficiency of a wind turbine is about 60%. Given a turbine having a blade length of 12 meters, a wind speed of 15 meters per second, and an efficiency of 45%, find the power output. The density of the air is rho equals 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so this formula that we derived, it's still a physics formula. That means you have to plug in SI units. Okay, my length is in SI units, my speed is in SI units, and my density is in SI units. So I'm good to go. All right, so let's go back to our page here. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and uh, solve this problem. All right, so we are looking for the power output. Now, remember that this formula we derived, this was based on 100% efficiency. Okay, so here we don't have 100% efficiency, it's 45%. So whatever we calculate as the power from here, we just take 45% of that number, and that's what our power output is going to be. All right, so we have a blade length, that's the radius, that's 12 meters. The wind speed V is 15 meters per second. Uh, the efficiency, we'll write that at the end, rho is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter and okay my percent efficiency is 45 percent again I'll, I'll do this piece at the end right now i'm going to deal with these first three uh, pieces there okay so power is one half rho a v cubed so that's one half density is 1.2 a, remember that's area of a circle, that's pi r squared. So pi times r squared. So let me just write that there. So there's pi r squared uh, times v cubed, so times 15 to the power 3. And grab your calculator and let's punch in, crunch these numbers. So 0 0.5 times 1.2 times pi times 12 squared, times 15 cubed. Okay, so we have, what is that? That's about 916,000. So 916,088, and that's watts. Okay, now I could convert that to kilowatts. I'll do that in the last step. So if our plant was 100% efficient, this is how much power it would be generating. This is how much energy it would be generating every second. But it's not 100% efficient, it's 45% efficient. So then we take that number and we multiply by 0 0.45. Okay, so times 0 0.45, and we get about 412,000. 240. Uh, let's use our sig figs here. Looking at the original question, we had two sig figs, two sig figs, two sig figs. Uh, don't look at the percent for sig figs, just look at these three values. And there are two sig figs in each of those. So we're looking at approximately 410,000 watts or 410 kilowatts. Okay. So based on the efficiency, that is how much power we generate. Hopefully that's okay. All right, let's go back to the slides. Okay. Air of constant density 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter is incident at a speed of 9 meters per second on the blades of a wind turbine. The turbine blades are each of length 7.5 meters. 
The air passes through the turbine without any change in direction. Immediately after passing through the blades, the speed of the air is 5 meters per second. The density of the air immediately after passing through the blades is 2.2 kilograms per cubic meter. The turbine and generator have an overall efficiency of 72%. Part A, or sorry, part I, calculate the power extracted from the air by the turbine. Okay. There's a lot of stuff going on in this question, so you have to be very careful. Okay, so I want to direct your attention to a couple of things. First things first, you have air of some kind of density moving at a certain speed. Okay, so that air moves through a turbine. Remember how the air compressor works. An air compressor works, well, it does exactly how the name is, how it's named. It takes the air and it compresses it. When air gets compressed, that means the particles are closer together and the density is higher. And so you go from 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter before it hits the blades. After the air passes through the blades, you're at 2.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Now the speed goes down from nine to five, but the density is there. So you have a certain amount of power coming in. You have a certain amount of power coming out. Um, there's gonna be a difference there. And the difference in power is how much power is extracted from the air by the turbine. Now. It doesn't mean that all that power that gets extracted gets efficiently used. I mean, we after all know that that's the efficiency, but we don't have to deal with that in this step. You just wanna know what that difference is. Now, what's not changing in this question is the length of the turbine blades, the 7.5 meters. So hopefully you have the slides in front of you. If not, just take a picture of this screen because there's a lot of numbers. I don't want you to miss out on what's happening. So we're gonna to go to our page here. We're gonna do this next example. Okay, so effectively you've got your wind turbine and this thing is rotating. Now on the left, you have data one and on the right, you have data two. And this air is passing through. Okay, so data one, what do we have? We have density one, it's 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. And this is incident at a speed of nine meters per second. Uh, R, R is the same for both. Right, the, the um, length of the blades doesn't change just because the wind speed does. R is 7.5 meters. Now, after it passes through the turbine blades, we know that the density of the air, rho two, is 2.2 kilograms per cubic meter, and the speed, V2, is five meters per second. Now, between one and two, you have some kind of power coming in, P1. You have some kind of power coming out, P2, and in between, you have some delta P. There's some difference there, and that is the difference that gets extracted by the blades. So what we're interested in here is delta P. Okay, so let's find P1, let's find P2, and we have our formula. So it's either in your formula sheet or you can use the one here, it's the same thing. P is one half rho AV cubed. So P is equal to one half rho AV cubed. Okay, so we're gonna find P1 first, so P1, is equal to one half rho one a one v one cubed. Now, a is something that's not gonna be affected. So actually, I don't even have to write a one. After all, a is pi r squared. And there's no r one and there's no r two, there's just r. So in fact, this is just a. Okay, so we've got one half times rho one, that's already in SI units, so 1.2. A is pi times r squared, so that's pi times 7.5 squared times 9 cubed. All right, you know what? I'm just going to get this ready too, P2, so that's 1 half rho 2 A V2 cubed. So that's 1 half times 2.2 times pi r squared, that's the same, times 5 cubed. So just grab your calculator, crunch up both those sides. So P1 is 0.5 times 1.2 times pi times 7.5 squared times 9 cubed. Okay, so what is that? That's about 77,000. 77,295 approximately. So that's P1. All right, P2. 0 0.5 times 2.2 uh, times pi times 7.5 squared times 5 cubed. 
Uh, so that's about 24, 298. Okay, let's just leave it like that. Watts. So you can see there's a difference there, right? That's what we expect. So we're going to go ahead and calculate delta P now. So that's going to be P2 minus P1. Okay, so, well, the delta P, okay, if you do P2 minus P1, of course, you're going to get a negative number. And just understand that this you have to have more coming in than coming out because the difference is what's getting used. And so even if you end up with a negative number here, it doesn't really matter. So maybe what we can do is say that delta P is the absolute value because we don't, the, the minus line has no significance here. So I'm going to take my 77, 295 and subtract this number and I end up with 52,997 approximately. Okay, so that's in watts. All right, so that is how much energy then goes to uh, the turbine. Okay, let's call this 53 kilowatts. Let's make that look a little bit nicer. After all, we have two sig figs in each one of our values in the question. Okay, all right, so let's go back to the slides for a moment. So the power extracted from the air by the turbine, we just determined that it is 53 kilowatts. Okay, part two, calculate the electrical power generated. Well, if you're thinking you just calculated that, you didn't. Okay, you calculated the amount of power that gets imparted to the turbine, but that's not how much power gets generated. However much power is imparted to the turbine, well, there's stuff that is being used there. So there is energy loss, there is friction, there's electrical resistance, there's all sorts of ways that this power gets reduced. And well, we don't have to worry about all those specific ways in this question. All that we need to worry about is that this turbine and generator have an overall efficiency of 72%. So this is uh, part two, so this was part one. Okay, <clears throat> so the efficiency is 72%. So that means 72% of this value gets used. So power generated is equal to 0 0.72 of 53 kilowatts. All right. 0 0.72 times 53, so 38, about 38 kilowatts is how much power is generated, or 38 joules per second. All right, let's go back to the slides. Okay, next. A wind generator produces 5 kilowatts of power for a wind speed of 6 meters per second. The best estimate for the power produced for a wind speed of 12 meters per second is... Now, now this question, you got to be a little careful, right? because there is this is not an exact way to calculate this. If you try to use the formula, it's not going to give you an answer that's going to help, because after all, if you're trying to solve this using the proportionality of a constant, and proportionality is fine, but if you actually try to figure out what that constant is, you're not going to get the right result here uh, because that constant relies on a density. So we are going to assume that there is a constant. We're not going to worry about solving for it uh, because the number that we get is not going to match anything that we have here. It's not going to help us get to our answer. So let's go back to our page here. Okay, so really what we have is we're given some pieces of information, some power, some speed, and we have to find out the power for a different speed. Now again, this is an estimate, it's not exact, so here we go. Um, let's say we have P1. P1 is 5 kilowatts, and that power is associated with the wind speed of V1. V1 is 6 meters per second. Okay, now we want to know the power output P2 for a wind speed of V2, which is 12 meters per second. So there is some kind of relationship between these two. Okay, so if I look at, okay, well, power is proportional to speed. Okay, so that means power is equal to some constant times uh, speed cubed. Sorry, power is proportional to speed cubed. Like I said, don't actually find what that constant is because you're going to get an exact answer. It's not going to match any of the answers that you have here. We're looking for an approximate answer here. Um, okay, so this is, let's call this P1, let's call this V1. So P1 is equal to some constant times V1 cubed. Now I know that I'm looking for P2, and that's equal to the constant times V2 cubed. 
Now, if you look at between V2 and V1, V2 is double V1, so I'm just going to use that here. So P2 is equal to K times 2 V1 cubed. Okay, so 2 V1 cubed, that cube gets applied to the 2, it gets applied to the V1, so I get K times 8 times V1 cubed is equal to P2. Well, remember that K times V1 cubed was P1, right? That's right here. So I'm going to rewrite this. This is 8 times K times V1 cubed. And this piece right here, that's just P1. So that means that's equal to 8 times P1. Okay, so well, what's P1? It's 5. So 8 times 5 kilowatts, that's 40 kilowatts. And so that is our new power. And if we go back to the slides, sure enough, you're looking at uh, part C there. Okay. All right. An electrical power generating station using fossil fuels as its source of energy has an output of two gigawatts. It has been suggested that the station should be replaced by wind turbines, each providing 0.8 megawatts of electrical power. Okay, so state two advantages of the use of wind power. Well, I'll give you three here. Okay, so wind power, first things first, it's a renewable energy source. Okay, so it is produced faster than we use it, although it might not produce as much energy as we need, and that is going to come down as a disadvantage in part two. Okay, so advantage number one, it is renewable. Advantage number two, uh, wind power does not generate greenhouse gases. And advantage number three, it is more efficient than nuclear power. Now, remember, efficiency means how much of the energy that is taken in can actually be useful. It doesn't mean that it's producing more. And this is one of the big drawbacks of wind energy is that you can even see in the question, each turbine produces 0.8 megawatts uh, and a generating station using fossil fuels uh, has an output of two gigawatts. Uh, giga means times one billion, mega means times one million. So that's a thousand times bigger times the, uh, the factor there as well. Disadvantage, well, wind depends on the weather. Just like solar panels, if you don't have sun, you're not getting much energy. If you don't have wind, you're not getting much energy. Okay, now, if you produce two gigawatts using fossil fuels and each turbine produces 0.8 megawatts, that means you need 2,500 turbines to replace one fossil fuel generating plant. And this is one of the, the big issues right now. Yes, we want to move to renewable energy, but it's just not that feasible. Where are you going to place 2,500 wind turbines? Okay, so that marks the end of wind energy generation. We are now going to move on to hydroelectric systems. Now, hydroelectric, most people, when they think of hydroelectric systems, they think of a dam. Okay, maybe you think of Niagara Falls. You have a large body of water that starts at a high elevation, it moves from high to low elevation, and by having that huge gravitational potential energy at the top of the dam, that gets converted to kinetic energy, which turns some kind of a, well, some kind of a wheel mechanism, which rotates, and that rotates uh, electrical currents. Well, it rotates coils in a magnetic field, which produces electrical currents, which then produce electricity. Uh, water will then get evaporated due to the sun. It comes back up to the top. Uh, it might also get pumped back up, depending on uh, if there's not enough water here. It might use some of the electricity to pump the water right back up, or if there's too much electricity produced, and the cycle repeats. Well, like I said, most people think of a dam. Okay? So you have water generation like this. And this is due to uh, the sun's motion. That's a sun-derived potential energy source. All right, so the picture you see here is that of the Hoover Dam. So this dam was actually built between 1931 and 1936 on the border of Nevada and Arizona. All right, now the other way of producing energy through water is using something called uh, a tidal barrage. Okay, and the picture on the right, this is something called the Rance Tidal Barrage. Now you'll notice if you look at the two power figures, you'll notice that the Rance Tidal Barrage does not produce as much power as the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam produces almost 10 times as much power. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, it's still a significant source of electricity. This tidal barrage is in France, and it uses the motion of the moon 
to drive potential energy and, well, electricity. We'll see how each of those work. We'll start off with the sun-driven hydroelectric dam. Okay, so, like I said, just like any other reactor has worked, uh, you need, at the end of the day, you need something to be rotating. Okay, you need coils of wire to be rotating within a magnetic field. So that's not in this picture, but just imagine that. The water is coming down the dam, down the side. Uh, that water is gaining kinetic energy. It's gaining speed. That speed's able to rotate uh, these coils of wire within the magnetic field, which produce electrical current. Now, that electricity can then move to the city. If you have too much electricity being generated, some of that electricity can be used to power this little mini turbine here, which will pump the water back up to the top. Okay, otherwise the sun will evaporate the water here and deposit it back on top. Okay, so it deposits the rainfall at a region of higher potential energy. Now this is very interesting and in what we just talked about. If you have not so much energy uh, being used, so you are producing more energy that is being used and you're not being able to sell it, sometimes Canada and the US do sell electricity back and forth if they, if they produce too much. You can pump that water back to the top. So use that energy to pump the water back up to the top to be used for a later point in time. So this is called pumped storage. So then if a point in time later comes that you need that electricity and you can't create it, well, you've got that extra water in the reservoir ready to go. All right. So I think the hydroelectric system with the sun, I think most people understand how that works. Okay. Now, what most people haven't seen is a tidal barrage and how that works. So there's a little animation here and I'm going to explain the steps. So just pay really close attention. The tidal barrage works based on the motion of the moon. Now, you know, we studied in 6.2, we studied Newton's law of gravitation. We know that objects with mass exert gravitational force on each other. So the earth exerts a force on the moon. The moon exerts that same force, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, back toward the earth. So just as the earth pulls on the moon, the moon is not exactly a sphere anymore. It's a little bit deformed. It's a kind of elongated toward the direction of the Earth. Now, even though the Moon is less massive than the Earth, it also pulls and stretches the Earth. Now, land does not stretch as easily as a liquid would. A solid does not stretch like a liquid. And so while the Earth's crust moves very, very little, the water on the surface of the Earth moves quite a bit. And this is how we get tides. When the moon is moving uh, around its orbit around the earth in certain locations with a, within a certain distance, it will invoke high tides. And then when it moves away, there will be a low tide. And those high and low tides are what power this electricity generation. So the first thing I want you to notice here, I mean, we've got a little bit of a closed system here. Notice there are these two walls blocking uh, on either side of the turbine. Okay, so, well, these are called sluice gates. You don't need to worry about that. It's spelled S-L-U-I-C-E, sluice gates. gates. Um, when these are down, there's no flow of water here. So this is almost like a closed system. So these fans, these rotator blades, they won't turn. And these uh, gates, they can be moved up and they can be moved down, depending on which way uh, the water is going to flow. Now, typically, the water from the ocean and the water on the estuary side. The estuary, this is essentially the bay. This is where the tide meets the stream. Okay, so this is effectively close to your land. Okay, you can see that the uh, elevation of the of the floor is a little bit higher here as well. Okay, when you have a high tide, so let me just start the animation. When you have a high tide, the water on the ocean or the seaside is elevated. Now these gates are going to open up, and so the flow can begin. Now you have high water here, low water here. Now the flow can move from left to right, turning the turbine. Okay. The gates will close now that the water level is the same. There's no pressure differential. The water stops flowing. When the tide recedes, the water moves down on the ocean side. Okay, these gates lift up again. Now you have more pressure on the estuary side. That water pressure is going to move from the estuary back to the ocean, the seaside, which will rotate these blades in the opposite direction. Right? But either way, they're rotating. Whether they're rotating clockwise or counterclockwise doesn't matter. They just have to rotate in order to produce electricity. Okay, now that the water level is the same again, there's no pressure differential and the water stops flowing. And the gates will, theoretically, the gates would close again. Okay, 
And this is why the slide says the turbine can be driven both ways during a tidal cycle. Okay, so the tide comes in, the ocean side increases, the tide recedes, the ocean side decreases. Okay, so feel free to pause the video, replay it, watch the animation, listen to my explanation again if you need it. Okay, it might take you a couple of times to understand how this exactly works. Now, whether you're dealing with the hydroelectric uh, dam or whether you're working with a tidal barrage, we can investigate this energy uh, conversion using a Sankey diagram. So it's been a while since we looked at that. Okay, so first things first, you have energy that's coming in either in the form of sunlight or a tide, and that gets, well, that, that gets moved to potential energy in the reservoir. Now, of course, you have some energy loss there. Uh, with the dam, you have evaporation. Well, you can also have evaporation with the tidal barrage. Okay, water is water. Okay, so that potential energy eventually gets converted to kinetic energy. But kinetic energy of what? Kinetic energy of the water moving. Uh, that water is eventually going to turn a turbine, and there's going to be friction there. There's friction between the air particles and the water particles as well, and whatever else they're moving against. Now, when you eventually produce electricity, there's going to be resistance in the wires. There's going to be friction once again. And so overall, there is some kind of efficiency here going from the original energy in the sunlight to the electricity. Now, next video, so we're going to stop there for today. Next video, we're going to start doing some calculations on the hydroelectric systems. So stay tuned for that. It will be the last video for section 8.1.